so we uh, decided to address today, one day before the fair, the topic which is relevant to contemporary culture, uh, which is the future of the museums. We want to talk about the future. But uh, for this reason, we invited visionaries and uh, thinkers from global environment, from US, Switzerland, Denmark, somewhere from uh, in the place from between Vienna and uh, Paris, which is Vorarlberg. <laughs> and um, to share and to learn from each other. So the future is about the people. So we as people are concerned what the future will bring. Me personally, I have children, son who's nine and daughter which is 15, so I really want to know what this new technology revolution is bringing to their lives. So my personal interest to learn from uh, these you know, visionaries and, and to interact. So um, that's it, that's the topic about uh, uh, the future. I pass my uh, microphone to Paul. Uh, cool. So good evening everyone and thank you for attending. So, well, is there a future for museums? That's a very uh, unusual title because most of the conference are speaking about the future of museum museum of tomorrow, but is there a future for museum is a strange question to ask to museum professionals. And being a museum consultant myself, it's an odd question. Um, but we are, uh, when we started thinking about this conference, we looked at, let's say, the year 2050. It seems that most of the companies, most of the industries in the, in the world are all thinking about this round number, which is 2050. Uh, and um, well, you have all this prediction in 2050, uh, the computers will be 1,000 times more powerful than now. Uh, the artificial intelligence, the robotics, everything will be completely different. Everything will change. And basically, uh, all the younger generation will somehow be 100% different from what we are now. And the, the question I'm, I'm always thinking, I'm always thinking about is the relevance of what we do as museum professional and the relevance of every other industry. They're all thinking, should we, are we going to exist in, uh, in 50 years? Are we going to be relevant? Are we going to be just, as a museum, are we just going to be a storage buildings and completely disconnected to the reality of uh, future generation? That's the questions we are asking ourselves, of course, in an optimist way. Uh, but still, I think the questions deserve to be asked, and that was our initial thinking. So, um, well, as uh, uh, Dimitri said, we have an incredible panel tonight, so I hope you will enjoy the discussion. And thank you again for attending. So the questions that Paul uh, and Dimitri brought about, this is what uh, made Axona Family Foundation and the Vesta Group to set up this panel. And um, of course, uh, this event would have been impossible without the help of uh, all the partners uh, who helped us put this together. First of all, we have to thank uh, Museums Cartier for hosting us here tonight, but also for their incredible support, patience, and enthusiasm, I think, with, with, with which they really accepted nearly all of the ideas that we came up with, and we came up with a lot of ideas. Um, I also want to thank uh, Vienna Contemporary team for all the organizational support, and um, thank you guys. Um, the poster that you see here tonight, which is a two-sided poster that you also find around the seats and which we encourage you all to take away with you, which is um, a Moscow-based design studio, Anna uh, Naumova and Kirill Bogdanskich. Uh, we're really happy with the poster in that it also um, sort of presents the topic of today without giving a definitive answer. So it um, opens with yes, no, don't know, which uh, kind of sets the platform for today's discussion. Um, and of course, we thank the speakers and we thank you all uh, for coming here tonight. We hope, uh, you know, there will be more people joining us because the registration list was was really full for today's um, event. And we think maybe it's just this last summer weather that uh, um, 
you know, keeps people from uh, coming a little bit earlier. Um, a li uh, just a few words about the format. We start with keynote speeches from uh, the speakers, uh, 10 minutes each, after which um, we then open up for a moderated discussion and then a Q&A session. I mean, if you have um, a burning desire to make a statement or ask a question, of course, you know, that we can pass on the microphones, but other than that, we would um, um, do that in the uh, final part of our um, conversation today. And uh, with this, uh, we welcome our first speaker today, uh, David Edwards. Well, thank you so much. It's really lovely to be here uh, with uh, my friends here, and I'm looking forward to a great conversation. You know, it, it's been said before, but it's worth saying again that the future has never existed. So what is going to happen here as we talk about the future? We're going to talk about now, and, and the, the relevance of now to the future is related to experimentation. And of course, culture, and artists uh, have always been experimenting at frontiers of experience and of knowledge. It happens that in the last 20 years, this experimentation has intensified. And the reason is pretty obvious. The nature of contemporary reality is evolving rapidly, not simply in major urban areas, but across the world for reasons that relate to the environment, that relate to society, that relate to technology, that relate to life itself. And this is leading to some pretty amazing experiments that are taking place at frontiers, as have happened before, but in a more intense way. So some of the obvious uh, sort of canonical experiments in the last 20 years uh, include Laboratorium, which was an exhibition by Hans Ulrich Obrist in Antwerp in 1999, they opened up some labs to artists and invited the public in. There's the weather project by Olafur Eliasson in the early 2000s at the Tate Modern, and then another interesting project, among many, many, many other projects by William Kentridge, uh, which started at the Laboratoire called The Refusal of Time, which is an opera that explores this notion of now and kind of the elasticity of now. So in 2007, I teach at Harvard University. I opened a cultural center in Paris called the Laboratoire. And the same year, uh, two other centers opened, one in London. Uh, Ken Arnold uh, opened uh, the Welcome Collection. And another in Dublin, Michael John Gorman opened the Science Gallery. And all three of us published an article in Nature uh, magazine within nine months of each other. And all of us were. Uh, for unrelated uh, and yet resonant ways, interested in creating cultural centers where the vocabulary was artistic and the questions were at frontiers, where we were inviting the public to explore frontiers with creators. In my case, I was interested in, in a true lab. Uh, if you look at labs in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or Vienna, uh, there's this special notion of a translational lab, meaning that what we do leads to other things that go on. Uh, I was interested in that kind of a culture lab, and so this is the laboratoire that we opened up uh, next to the Louvre in, in Paris. And so the notion, we've done 22 experiments now, and the lab has moved to uh, next to MIT and Harvard uh, a year and a half ago. We invite amazing artists and designers. Here's a conversation with uh, Francois Azembourg, a designer, uh, to uh, reflect on and explore uh, frontiers that are often hard to access. And we invite an experiment. And these experiments lead to exhibitions, and we invite the public into the exhibition. Now, the Exhibitions lead to works that may be works of design. In this case, it led to a new food form where we eat the packaging. So you make f packaged food like nature makes fruit uh, and is now uh, actually a commercialized design in a couple thousand stores in the United States. Or other work uh, like this project with Shilpa Gupta, who's a Mumbai-based artist, 
and did a project with Mazarin Banerjee, who's a, a neuroscientist at Harvard. Uh, she's interested, Shilpa, uh, in the psychology of political terror. This was right around the time of some of the terror attacks that were going on there at the time. And so this work, 5,000 microphones with Shilpa's voice kind of uh, racing around it, is now in the permanent collection of the Louisiana Museum outside of Copenhagen. A work by Mark Dian, more recently, uh, a contemporary artist, New York-based contemporary artist, exploring the future of the ocean, and uh, a collaboration with a marine biologist uh, called *The Trouble with Jellyfish*, which is now traveling to the National Academies for a retreat, where Doug Aiken, uh, the LA-based artist, will invite us all to go into his underwater pavilion that opens in early. November off site of Catalina Island, and there's a bridge that we all kind of swim down into this underwater pavilion. It's his sort of vision of Earth uh, works uh, in the 21st century. Um, so there's this incredible effervescence that's going on right now at Frontiers. It's really not fitting into museums as we think of them today, but it's creating environments like these where People are coming for experiences. I think that the content of cultural exchange today is experiential. Uh, this particular project, uh, when we opened uh, now in Cambridge, uh, we did a, an experiment with Todd Macover, who's a, a composer, and Neri Oxman, a uh, really brilliant designer, uh, looking at vocal vibrations and their relationship to uh, sensorial wellness and health. And it led to this uh, chaise, this uh, called Gemini, which is now in the permanent collection of the uh, San Francisco MoMA. And so these are all just purely experimental works that are inviting a sensorial experience. And they're becoming increasingly the vernacular of contemporary art. This project, which is actually didn't start at the Laboratoire, but many of you probably know, the Rain Room. Uh, Random International. Um, it opened at the Barbican several years ago, and this project, which invites us to experience rain that actually doesn't touch us, uh, very primitive but um, uh, profound exhibition, has now had over a million visitors. It's traveling all over the world, and we then, with the opening of that exhibition, began to work with Random on another project, which is just like tomorrow night, opening in London, in New York. Uh, with the Pace Gallery, we're exploring uh, this uh, notion of, of uh, human movement and, and uh, something that's called the Uncanny Valley. So this is in the air today. And uh, by the way, we do a lot in the air uh, it, uh, in our sensorial experiments. This particular project called the WAF uh, with Marc Bretillot, uh, where we take food and we put it in the air and we create sensorial experiences that are pretty magical and, and have effectively no calories or no alcohol, um, but are really quite poetic. And it makes you think of a bar or a restaurant. And indeed, when we moved to uh, Cambridge, we opened what had already begun to grow in Paris, a restaurant, which is not uh, unconnected to our conversation here today. One of the big uh, questions, of course, in um, in the life of the museum is what is that life and what is driving it? And I can tell you at Harvard University what's definitely not driving students to come and listen to me is what I say, actually. The information content of a professor at Harvard University is increasingly uh, discounted. Experience matters. And one of the most fascinating places where exper experience is happening and experimental exchange is happening is around food. And so we have a food uh, a restaurant called Cafe Art Science where we do experiments. We have great food, but we also do experiments. And some of the work that comes out of the laboratoire moves into uh, the cafe. Uh, we are, uh, have been developing digital scent, um, uh, which is kind of shown here, something called Cyrano, uh, which in the, in the restaurant, uh, we, we did a meal with Farron Adria just a, several months ago, a uh, scent meal, um, which uh, if anybody wants to see some pictures of Farron with his nose and his food, I can show you afterwards. Um, but we make great food, too. So there's, there's more going on than simply uh, experimentation. Fundamentally, we're trying to drive 
uh, a natural uh, effervescent experimental exchange with the public and to create the future together. The bottom line that I want to really draw here is that the future is not going to be made by anybody in this room. It's not an inventor in Silicon Valley. It's not an artist. It's everybody, right? And so the, the fact is that the future will be co-owned and co-created. And so the challenge right now, I think, to all of us is to create live cultural venues where we uh, experiment together. Thank you.